Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. The title of this video is 30 Years as a Christian. Well, first of all, you may be wondering why I pronounce it Christian rather than Christian. So let me take a moment just to explain that importance of that. Um, if I was to ask people um, to define what is Christianity, uh, what is a Christian, uh, sadly, very few people would be able to explain it correctly. That is, correctly um, according to how we would uh, define it on what the Bible says. What, what, would, what is Christianity according to the Bible? What is a Christian according to the Bible? Well, most people, uh, they're not familiar with that. They, they haven't read the Bible, studied the Bible, or un, they don't understand the Bible. So they, it, it, most people say uh, Christianity is a religion. Well, Christianity is not really a religion. True Christianity is a relationship. See, uh, all the religions of the world, really, there's no difference in them. Every religion is based on the idea that um, there's a system of things that we are required to do in order to earn approval from God, to earn acceptance from God. And if, if we do these religious things well enough, we die and get judged by God, and God will say, well, you were good enough, you get to go to heaven. Uh, that's how people see, uh, uh, that's what religions are. It's based upon uh, how well we performed, how well we behaved. Uh, but the Christianity we find in the Bible is, it's not based upon uh, what we do in our lives or don't do. It's, it's Christianity in the Bible is based upon what Jesus has done for us. And that is simply that he died on a cross and paid for all of our sins. So because our sins are paid for, uh, there's reconciliation between man and God. The sin problem was resolved on the cross. Jesus says it is finished. And therefore, uh, there, God is not angry with you. God is not holding sin against you because your sins were paid for by, by Jesus. So Christianity is not based upon the good things that we do. Christianity is based on the good thing that Jesus did for us in paying for our sins. Uh, so, and Christianity is not based upon, you know, who we are. You know, I, oh, you, you look at people and you... You evaluate them, you say, well, that's a good person. No, it's not based upon how good we are or who we are. Christianity is based upon who Jesus is. He is eternal God Almighty who came down from heaven, became a man, and he said the, the purpose, the reason for, for him being incarnated and becoming God with us, God manifest in the flesh, he said he had to do it because he came to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. So by Jesus dying on that cross and paying for our sins, he set you and me, all of mankind, he set us free from uh, the, the judgment and condemnation. Uh, so this is, this is why I say Christian and Christianity, because it, uh, it emphasizes Christ. It does not emphasize ourselves. It puts it in the right perspective that our salvation is not an, an earned reward for our good behavior. It's not about us and how well we do. It's, it's a, it's, salvation is a free gift 
from Jesus Christ offered to everyone in the world without exception, and we receive the free gift simply by believing, acknowledging that Jesus paid for our sins, and, and uh, it's, it's based upon all the glory, all the credit belongs to Jesus for what, what he did for us. And so a Christian is someone who relies completely on Jesus Christ for their salvation. They, they're relying on who he is, our Savior God. They're relying on what he's done for us. He paid for our sins entirely. So that's not the purpose of this video, but uh, I guess um, I, it was necessary to explain that. Uh, 30 years as a Christian. Uh, well, this is December 6th. Uh, 2016, 30 years ago, on this very day, December 6th, 1986, there was an event in my life that, uh, you know, I can never forget because I've never been the same since. My, I had wonderful parents. Here's a picture of my mother and my father. Okay, and they were wonderful parents, and I was so blessed to be born um, as their son. But 30 years ago, there was a death in my family. My mother died. Mary Nell Fritz Boozer was her name. And when she died, it was sudden and surprising. Uh, she she wasn't uh, suffering like a, a, an illness where we expected her to die soon. Um, she just died in her sleep, I'm assuming, peacefully one night. And when I woke up that morning, I received a phone call and I was shocked. Not only because it was unexpected, but because... Personally, I've never had to deal with a, a death in the family, a death of a close friend. Uh, so it was a, a, one of the most significant events of my life, the death of my mother, which led to uh, the, the birth of me. Not, not the birth of my from my mother's womb, not the physical birth from my mother, but the new birth as a Christian. My mother's death led to my new birth, and I'll tell you how that all came about now. But there's a saying uh, that uh, if you are born once, then you will die twice. And if you are born twice, then you will die only once. And I think that's worth explaining. Um, if, you are, uh, if you are born once, that means you, the, the physical birth from your mother's womb. If, if this is the only birth you have, the physical birth, uh, then you are born as a human, uh, as a, you are the result of procreation, God created Adam and Eve, but he didn't create you and me. We are the result of procreation, uh, the result of our parents uniting uh, and, 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 uh, and giving, giving birth to us. That's called procreation. And since Adam and Eve, there has been procreation, and that's, that's how we all got here. Uh, but if a person is born once, their, their destiny, because of the fall of man and because of uh, our, our, our inherited sin problem and also our, the, our, our own uh, bad thoughts, bad deeds, uh, which the Bible refers to as sin, our, fa our failings, our shortcomings, our, our, our missing the mark, our failure to be perfect, uh, because of that, uh, man was doomed. And man was uh, uh, fated to uh, 
die and be judged by God, the Bible says that um, it is appointed for man to die once, and then the judgment. So we're born, we live our lives, it's fate that we will die once, appointed that man will die once, and then the judgment. We get judged by God. And none of us could go before God at that judgment and claim that we've been perfect, that we've, every thought, word, and deed in our lives was perfect. Uh, if you can understand that and acknowledge that you, it's impossible to plead your case before God at the judgment and say, I've been perfect, so I deserve heaven. If you can understand that, uh, <clears throat> then you'll, you'll understand the, the uh, situation that we all, we all face. Uh, it's a hopeless, helpless situation um, because man's incapable of being born perfect and, and living a perfect life. And the Bible tells us that that's the reason God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the Bible tells us that because of man's hopeless, helpless situation, uh, God loved us so much that he would intervene in this and, and uh, provide the solution. And the solution was that he would become a man, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior God, and he, and he would do that in order to die. He, God cannot die, so he had to become a man in order to die. So he suffered and died on that cross and paid for our sins. God intervened because he loves you that much. So if we are born once, we'll die twice means that we die, we face the judgment, we're found lacking uh, um, because we're not perfect and uh, we, if, if a person never put their faith in the Savior the Bible says this is the one requirement in your whole life there's one thing you must do right and that is you must rely completely on Jesus Christ for your salvation believe that he paid for your sins and you get to go to heaven for that reason alone and, and that's the one thing that God asking and expecting you to do. If you put your faith in Jesus, then you're what the Bible calls saved. You receive the gift of eternal life. If you failed your whole life and, rejected, and you've rejected Jesus and the free gift of salvation, then at that judgment, you're lacking. You didn't receive the free gift and therefore you suffer what the Bible calls the second death in the lake of fire. So at the judgment, you'll die you'll go into the lake of fire and you perish. Now, if you are born twice, as I was, De December 1986, I was born a second time. Uh, the Bible says, born spiritually, born from above. The new birth, uh, uh, and that was when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, the second birth. And because I was born twice, when I go to die, physically, I go to the judgment, and God uh, says, uh, well done, you trusted Jesus Christ, you have eternal life, you get to live forever with no more death or sorrow or crying or pain in the, in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, so if you are born once, you'll die physically, get judged, and then die the second death. If you're born twice, as I was, born from my mother's womb in November uh, 1950, born again from above spiritually when I put my faith in Jesus Christ in December of 1986, born twice in the, the new birth, uh, now that assures me that I, do, I will not die the second death in the lake of fire. So that's what happened. Um, my mother died and it caused me to ask questions. I needed answers. As I said, no one in my family or none of my friends had died. The first time in my life, confronted with this, I asked myself, 
What is the purpose of life? What happens after we die? What about the Bible? Is the Bible true? What about all the religions of the world? All these questions came to my mind. I needed answers. Well, my mother died December 6th, 1986. And that's when this process began. And right after that, because it's December, the uh, televisions, uh, the, every year before Christmas, they start showing Jesus movies. And I, I saw this movie, Jesus of Nazareth. And I loved the movie. Uh, I had seen it before, but when I watched it before, it was not the right time in my life. It didn't impact me in, in the way it did in December 1986. And, and uh, it had a great impact on me, but I still didn't understand. So uh, at the end of the movie, when it, they rolled the credits, the last thing it showed on the screen was, for more information, read the Bible. That's what I did. There was a Bible in our house, and that night I started reading it. And I, I started reading the New Testament, thankfully, because that's where I was able to get the answers quickly. I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and as I'm reading the, the Gospel of John, the book of John, I understood all the things I just told you, that salvation, eternal life in heaven, is not something we earn through our good behavior, but it's something we receive as a free gift when we put our faith in Jesus. I understood that because that's what the book of John teaches us. In the book of John, it actually says that the purpose of the book, the reason the book was written, was so that we can learn how we can receive this salvation. So in the book of John, I understood that Jesus is God who became a man who died for my sins and was raised from the dead as a sign to prove that all his claims are true. He is God. He is Savior. He did pay for our sins and he offers eternal life, promises eternal life to everyone who puts their faith completely in him. This is what I learned from the book of John. And uh, when I understood it, I believed it. I was joyful. And I uh, now, some people, when they put their faith in Jesus and receive the free gift of salvation, uh, they do it with tears, broken heart, a broken heartedness over their sins in their life, a uh, feeling of contrition, uh, re re repenting and believing that uh, they, they uh, were needed to change their lives and so on. But none of that happened with me because I understood that it was not a sad occasion that should require tears on It was a joyful occasion. Joyful. It was matter of fact, that's why the Bible refers to this message I'm telling you now as the gospel. That's a Greek word that means good news. This was good news. It was the best news I ever heard. I received the promise of eternal life in the heaven, in the new heavens and new earth. It's promised to me. It's guaranteed to me. It's certain. I am assured of it simply because of what Jesus did for me and my reliance on him for it. So that was my experience. Um, so when I was born in 1950, as I said, it was a physical birth. God made me, but when I was born again in 1986, I was born again. Uh, now this shirt here, I like to wear various shirts that relate to these messages. God and it says, one of a kind, God made. So as I said, I was made physically in 1950. I was made again, recreated. The Bible says this: you become a new creature, a new creation. Because now, my spirit, which was actually dead, not connected to God, my spirit was, the Bible says, quickened. That means brought to life. And my spirit was brought to life because the Holy Spirit of God, when I put my faith in Jesus, entered into me. This is what the Bible calls 
uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's when you're, the Holy Spirit enters you, and then the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God indwells me. That means it continues to live in me. And the Bible says that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. It means that um, it's the Spirit is in me permanently, and uh, the Spirit will not leave me. Jesus said uh, uh, he'll never leave me or forsake me. The Spirit, Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, and it's indwelling me, and I never have to worry for, that for any reason if I... If I misbehave, if I sin, if I, my faith is waning, for no reason, Jesus said that um, even if we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He can't break his promise. He promised, I will not forsake you. You're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you trusted me. And even if you lose faith or if you misbehave, don't worry. You're promised eternal life. So this is what happened when I put my faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God has been living in me now for 30 years. Um, so, uh, so what's happened to me over this 30-year process? Um, I would say that, uh, that just as it says here, in the shirt, one of a kind. Let me get that back in here. It says, one of a kind, God made. We're unique. We are unique when we're born physically. And, and we're also unique when we're born again, when we're born spiritually. When our spirit is brought to life and united with the Holy Spirit of God, we're still unique creations. Um, just as no two people, when they're born into the world, do their lives and actually marry each other perfectly, some people's lives are struggles their entire life. They just never seem to succeed. Other people have great success quickly in their lives. Other people succeed gradually over their lives. But um, we're it's all an individual process that we're going through in our lives, how much we succeed in physically. The same thing is true about our spiritual life, our spiritual growth and maturity. We're unique individuals. And therefore, some people, when the Holy Spirit enters them and the Holy Spirit transforms us, some people... Uh, embrace the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, you see great changes in their life. You, you see immediate and, and dramatic changes. Other people, their spiritual growth and maturity is more gradual. And other people, they resist the Holy Spirit and even grieve the Spirit, the Scriptures tells us. Uh, and... Uh, Fight against the Spirit's uh, uh, desire to change us and transform us so that, so that uh, we're living a life that God uh, plans for us, that wants, wants us to, to live. And the life He wants to li us to live is, He says, there's two things I want you to do. Love God and love your fellow man. And Jesus said, if you want to be really great, become a servant. Serve your fellow man. The greatest among you will become the servant of all. So it's important that we don't judge each other and, and, and question each other, well, oh, how good of a Christian, or even if you're a Christian at all. Don't ever question other people's salvation based upon how well they're achieving, uh, working at and achieving uh, spiritual maturity and success. But uh, the Spirit is in us, transforming us, and we are called to be servants, to serve God somehow. So in my life over 30 years, I'll give you a recap briefly of how that's gone. Uh, I, I continued studying the Bible right after I read, read the 
Gospel of John, and I got saved. Well, I was hooked on the Bible, and I continued reading it now, for, studying it for 30 years. And after a while, when I was competent, I began teaching it. Um, but one of the things that I noticed after I got saved is that uh, many of the people who knew me, friends and even family, they were shocked by this. Uh, what? You're, you're, a, a, you're a Christian? I thought you were already a Christian. Didn't you? Didn't you went to church? You were a Roman Catholic. And you're, that's the way you were raised. But as a Roman Catholic, uh, I was never born again. I never put my complete reliance in Jesus. See, Roman Catholics, even though they believe certain things correctly, like the deity of Christ, uh, the virgin birth, uh, the uh, death on the cross for our sins, all these things that they, they believe correctly, uh, a Roman Catholic never relies on Jesus, puts their faith entirely in Jesus. Roman Catholics believe, and this is what I was, how I was raised, and that uh, going to heaven is based upon how well we practice Roman Catholicism. Uh, did we get baptized? Did we go to confession, go to communion? Did, did, did we attend church? Did we get sin out of our life? And, if, and, and then God will judge us and you know, put it on a scale. And if you've done more good than bad, maybe you'll get to go to heaven. If not, maybe you have to go to purgatory and have your sins purged for who knows how long until you're acceptable and go to heaven. Or, or maybe if you're so bad, you just can't even go to purgatory, you go to hell. This is how uh, I was raised. This is what I thought. And so that's what Roman Catholics believe. They, they do not believe the gospel, the good news, that salvation is a free gift, and you receive it instantaneously when you put your faith entirely in Jesus, and that uh, it's uh, irrevocable and irreversible. They don't believe that. So uh, even though people knew that hey, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, now they're saying, well, what do you mean now? You're, you're no longer a Roman Catholic, and you're reading the Bible, and uh, you're a, yeah, what are you, some kind of a Jesus freak? So that was the initial reaction by some of my friends and family. Uh, in fact, it, the, it was so bad um, at that point in time with my wife that it presented such a conflict in the, in the family. And I wasn't trying to beat her over the head to make her read the Bible and agree with me. Or I, but, but because I was excited and wanted to read the Bible all the time, she thought I was lost my mind. And that... Uh, I ended up having to leave it, leave my house and separate and move out for, I don't remember if it was, I think it was three or four months. But over the period of many years now, of course, my wife under, began to understand all this and accept it and believe too. But initially, uh, the reaction was that I was some kind of a uh, extreme nut that uh, lost my mind. But over the years, when people saw that this was not a temporary kind of fad I was going through, uh, more and more people in my family and friends came to also believe. And uh, they, they knew that uh, they, they eventually wanted to hear what I had to say. And all I had to say was what the Bible said. And they, when they learned what I learned, they were shocked and amazed because most people don't know that salvation is offered as a free gift. No strings attached. It's not based upon you earning it through all your own efforts. When people learn that salvation is a free gift because of what Jesus did for us, they're shocked and amazed. And when they, uh, when they really believe, then they're, they're joyful because it's such good news. Uh, it wasn't all rosy, though, all these years. Um, I went to a lot of churches. I got very involved initially after I was saved, and uh, within a couple of months, I, uh, I, I, just, I knew I wanted to start going to a church, and I got somehow uh, directed to a, a Nazarene church, and I liked it very much. I loved the pastor, and his teaching was good and correct, biblically, about salvation. And I, because I had many years' experience in sales, um, uh, I, 
I was given the privilege of calling on people who uh, uh, attended church, and uh, they leave their name and say that maybe you can contact us and we'd like to learn more about your church and your beliefs. So it was my job. I was given the assignment to call on these people. I took a class called Evangelism Explosion. Uh, the class was created by D. James Kennedy, uh, and it was a class on evangelism, how to tell people the good news and present the gospel to them. So that's how that's what I started doing. Um, and then there, sadly, there, I realized that there's politics in the churches. And the pastor that I loved so much was ousted. And it's nothing, it was not because of anything scandalous or any failings on his part, in my opinion. Uh, it was kind of a, just a political move by the board of directors, and it was shocking to me. And so after that, I left the Nazarene church, and, and uh, I became a taster of churches in Las Vegas. I must have attended 20 different churches over the period of several years, and I uh, gave me uh, an experience, uh, a broad experience with all the different types of churches, and I found that very few of the churches even believed what the Bible says about salvation. Almost all the churches are, are teaching either outright opposite of what I've told you here, or it's, it's um, um, uh, they, they, they tamper with the message that salvation is a free gift. They tamper with it enough that it's, as the Apostle Paul says, that it's uh, <clears throat> salvation must be entirely because of the grace of God, not because of your your own work. Uh, or, or it has to be entirely based upon your own work, and Jesus has nothing to do with it, but you're just going to try to work your way to heaven. And, uh, of course, that always ends in failure and futility. So Paul says that you cannot mix grace and works together. It has to be in one or the other. And so I found that almost all the churches were mixing it and saying, yeah, you've got to believe in Jesus, but you better repent of your sins. You better change your life. You better get baptized. You better do this. They were adding to it. So I, I became aware and, and very much dis disillusioned that, uh, that the churches were... were didn't even understand the most basic fundamental thing about Christianity. Uh, so I didn't attend a church, and, and, and I didn't really have any you know, like Christian friends and Bible study and fellowship except for my own. I was like a solo Christian. And uh, that's not good. You, you end up, you, we need, the Bible tells us we need a fellowship, and uh, we're supposed to be there for each other. And so that resulted in me becoming what I would classify as backslidden. I didn't lose my faith, but my my zeal and uh, and my my time I had no time in fellowship. Even my studying of the Bible was reduced. I was backslidden for a while. Um, then there came a point where I met some Christians at work, uh, and uh, we decided to have a Bible study, and we started having the Bible study at my house. And it wasn't really like I was trying to teach the Bible study, it was more of a collaborative thing. And we, Once I started having the Bible study at my house, and I started having fellowship with other, other believers, uh, my backslidden state was uh, cured. And I got zeal again, and uh, there's nothing that I love more than talking about Jesus, talking about the Bible, to anybody, especially with other believers, because we uh, we we have this uh, common faith that we share. But but also even with a non-believer, because it gives us the opportunity to tell them this good news. Uh, this home Bible study eventually became uh, evolved into what I'd call a home church. Uh, and that home church at my house was went on for about seven years. But one of the things that um, I learned is that uh, everything is, is temporary. 
uh, that uh, eventually, um, kind of like in the in the, in all of creation, we have a law of of uh, physics, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. Eventually, everything crumbles apart, and and that, that even includes our relationships and friendships. Sadly, uh, there's a poem or a story about getting on a train and sitting in a, next to someone on the train and, and eventually they get off on it and get off on one of the stops and it's, it's, it's uh, relating that to our lives. All of our relationships are temporary. Uh, the first relationship is with our parents and our siblings and then eventually the parents leave through, through death. And uh, so you're going to have new people coming on the train and you're going to you're going to maybe change seats on the train. So all of our relationships, we've got to enjoy them while they last. But no relationship is, is permanent until we get into eternity. Um, but my, my, my passion for the Bible and my passion for evangelism and it grew so much that I reached a point where I decided I wanted to do full-time ministry. Now, ministry just means uh, 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 service. So I wanted to serve the Lord. Uh, every Christian, when they put their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in them, and the Holy Spirit now wants us to, to guide us through life and help help us to uh, in our uh, service for our fellow man. You know, serve other believers and serve the lost and lead them to Jesus Christ. So that's what we're called to do, all of us. And some people do it much better. Some people are absolute failures at that. But I became passionate and really wanted to serve and do ministry work. Uh, but I had a full-time job. I had responsibilities. So I started praying that the Lord would bless me financially so that I uh, could leave my job, not be encumbered by punching a clock and having to be the at that workplace for 40 hours a week. And I said, Lord, if, if you, you set me free from that, the time that I spent in work, I can now put that time in working for you in ministry. And uh, I was blessed. Uh, I'm not going to tell you all the details about it, but financially, uh, I was able to retire young at the age of 54. So I've been retired now for 12 years from earning a living. I'm not a rich man, uh, but we've been able to pay our bills and, and uh, have enough without, not, without stressing out and worrying and uh, live a good life. Um, but it's necessary to, necessary to live on a budget. But I, I was blessed so that I could uh, now have that free time to do ministry, and that's what I've been doing uh, since December of 2004, I've been full-time ministry. That doesn't mean that I'm necessarily spending 40 hours a week doing ministry works, but what kind of ministry works have I done? Well, the first thing that uh, I want to do is determine exactly what the Lord had, had in mind for me. And because I've done a lot of public speaking in life, and I've done a lot of sales, uh, I, I've done probably in my career thousands of pup speeches and uh, I knew that this ability could be used for the Lord. So uh, at that time there was a TV show that got popular called The Way of the Master by uh, Kirk Cameron, an actor, and Ray Comfort, a uh, Bible teacher. And when I watched their show I really liked parts of it because uh, it showed me that uh, how to uh, how to engage in evangelism publicly uh, through street preaching and other ways, but all but but the problem with it is they were teaching a um, uh, a heresy that that salvation is uh, two pronged that uh, you must believe in Jesus and repent of your sins, which they mean repenting of your sins means that not only be sorry for your sins but you've got to get sin entirely out of your life. So it was a damnable heresy. Uh, so on one hand, I learned techniques so I could go out and street preach. 
But on the other hand, uh, I couldn't be affiliated with them because they were teaching the wrong, the false gospel. But I started street preaching, and then I met a lot of other street preachers here in Las Vegas. And over the period of about five years, I, uh, I was preaching uh, probably an average three or four days a week uh, on Las Vegas Boulevard. Uh, I met and got to know very well at least a hundred street preachers, not just from Las Vegas, but from all over the country they would come. And, uh, for holidays they'd come to town, I'd put them up at my house, and they'd, some of them would join them in my Bible studies. But what I found out is that almost all of them were preaching a false message. Uh, salvation and repenting of your sins. Um, and many of them also were conducting themselves in a way that they were not being what I would call real ambassadors for Christ. That uh, they were mean-spirited uh, and just very... I, I don't think Jesus would, would say, well done to them. This is not what he had in mind for us in, in terms of being ambassadors for him or representing him. Uh, many times I've heard the public, the audience, say something like, well, that street preacher, the way he's acting, if that's what a Christian is, I don't ever want to be one. So I was affiliated with them uh, for about five years. At one point they even gave me the annual award that goes out among all the street preachers in America as Street Preacher of the Year. So I knew them well, um, and uh, I was recognized and uh, uh, honored by them, but at the same time I realized I needed to disassociate because of their bad behavior and because of the false message that most of them were preaching. Uh, at that same time, though, I found out about YouTube. And uh, when I started a YouTube channel, one of the people uh, who was part of that street ministry, uh, Joy Palmquist, her husband was one of the street preachers, kind of a protege of mine. Well, Joy... She said, oh, Luke, don't get on YouTube. It's, it's, it's horrible. They're, 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 people are so mean on YouTube. And, uh, of course, I did it anyway, but it turns out that she's absolutely right. YouTube can be very brutal as far as the, the kind of comments and, and uh, interactions that I've had with people. <clears throat> I've met a lot of good people. I, I, I've, met, I've made a lot of friendships. But I've also learned that uh, people can be very cruel and hateful on YouTube. So there's been a lot of highs and lows during this, this, this period. But on YouTube now, I, I can look back and say, by the way, this on YouTube, it's been about eight and a half years now. I've, I've had this channel. And so over eight and a half years, I've produced myself for about 700 videos. Uh, I produced more, but some of them I've removed because I wasn't happy with them. And, 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 but, so I have almost 700 videos now on YouTube that I've produced. I have thousands of other videos I've collected that other people have produced, and I've put all of this into various playlists. And I honestly believe that my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, may be the most comprehensive uh, Christian YouTube channel in terms of not only telling people the good news about Jesus and how to get saved, but answering questions on every kind of theological subject and question that, that there is. Uh, there's, there's probably, there's hardly a question or a subject that I have uh, not addressed on my YouTube channel. So I think my channel is a resource for anybody who has any kind of theological question or Bible question. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. So now the question is, what about the next 30 years? Well, I'm 66, so I don't expect it to be 30 years, but for the foreseeable future, uh, I'm going to continue doing what I've been doing on YouTube, but someone made a comment just the other day. It's not the first time I've heard this. Well, you're, I, I, I love your videos but, and your teaching, but 
a lot of the videos are so long, and you know, can you make some shorter, maybe 10 or 20 minutes long? And that's, that's a good point. Sometimes it's necessary for a long video because the subject requires it. But I, my immediate plan now is, and for the foreseeable future, I plan on making a lot of short videos. I'm going to go from the Bible in Genesis 1-1 and go all the way through. And as I read it, every, every verse that I think is really a significant verse, I'm going to make a video on that one verse. And I'm going to try to keep the videos, you know, five or ten minutes long at the most. So there will be a lot of short videos. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it daily or not, but I'm going to do it very frequently. So I expect these videos, I, maybe I'll title it, my uh, 1,000 favorite Bible verses. <laughs> I don't know if it will be 1,000. But as I go through the Bible and find any verse I feel, find really, really profound and important or significant to me and to you, I'm going to make a short video on it. So that's my immediate plans, and I expect that will keep me busy for years to come. So um, that's it. 30 years as a Christian. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for subscribing to my channel. Uh, thank you to everybody who has uh, uh, encouraged me. And, and even thank you to those people who have uh, argued against me, uh, said I'm wrong, uh, and caused me to think and reconsider. And guess what? There's been a few times over the years where uh, I've actually changed my mind on a theological position. So I'm, I'm happy to consider the other point of view. And, and, and honestly, if, if I, I am shown to be wrong, then I'll, I'll switch over to, to the other side. I've done it before and I'm willing to do it again uh, if I'm wrong. So thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.